we, we need to do this in chunks of like 5, 15 minutes or whatever. So let's just recap what I was talking about. Well, we had the basic concept of, well, the hanging arm, skeletal alignment and everything. And then people talk about mid-range motion. I mean, okay, you can move a little bit here and there, but not too much. Um, however, if I now take as an example, striking this chord instead, um, it's an A, C sharp, G. Now, I find a comfortable position doing it like this. However, as we can see, I have now twisted my hand almost to the extreme possible. The, the hip joint arch is passive. And then you can ask yourself, well, why is this comfortable? I mean, this certainly was comfortable. But why don't I strike it like this if I want to be aligned and have an arch? It's a valid question, isn't it? Why do I settle like this in a twisted position and with a passive arch? Now, of course, no sane pianist or piano teacher would advocate this. But the question is then, well, are there basic principles that explains why this is good and this is good? Um, it does seem like the hanging arm approach, skeletal alignment, doesn't quite stand up to scrutiny in this case. Certainly we have a certain possible range of motion. I mean, I can raise my wrist and then I can lower it, but there are extremes. But how do we know is the critical range of motion equal to the possible range of motion? Well, then you could ask the question, why introduce a concept such as mid-range motion in the first place? Um, So therefore, if we move forward, I was thinking whether we could in fact extract some common parameters, theoretical, that explains why this is good, at the same time as explaining why this is good. And the approach, I guess, is the Alan Fraser approach, essentially, standing fingers. Um, when talking about the standing fingers, first I guess we need to do a distinction between the action of striking the key and standing on the key. When my hand is in, when striking the key, of course, Alan Fraser says that, well, we should use the hip joint uh, fulcrum here, which of course makes total sense. But then, my point being that you can stand on the key in, in various different ways. And this is also something that is clear from Alan Fraser's videos in, in various circumstances. Um, but the first thing I, I would like to do is um, to define what does it mean to stand on the key. So I'm going to go into a rather extreme position now here, uh, putting the arm perfectly straight here. And, and um, well, certainly my hand, my finger is not standing on the key. But what does it really mean? Well, if you if you formulate it naively, you could say that the muscle groups responsible for curling the fingers or pushing them are not involved in the key depression because if they came into action the finger would just fall off the key wouldn't it um, could we now if you just uh, sit down and we take it from this angle now uh, so if we start here and, and then I can show you where we're heading 
I will now sort of try to maintain the standing position here and sort of just fold the other apparatus around um, and forming an arch while maintaining this sort of nice standing feeling of the finger. Um, but if we go back to this place and then sort of move on from here, do I really need to have a sort of 90 degree angle here between the, the fingertip and the wrist? Or can I find standing positions? And it seems like I can be standing like this, but there comes a mo moment when now I need to push down the finger. So, but here I seem to be standing comfortable, comfortably. And what characterizes this state? Well, there seems to be a 45 degree angle between the fingertip and the, the keystone here, which in this particular case is characterized by uh, the joint of maximum curvature. Uh, okay, so this is not standing. Now I need to push the finger down because the angle is too low. However, I can alleviate that by doing this. But now I've changed the, the joint of maximum curvature. Maybe this is more clear like this with the left hand. Uh, I switched from this rather awkward position to this. But what I've now done is I've shifted the point of maximum curvature from the wrist to, to the hip joint. The reason why I speak of maximum curvature is because technically speaking the wrist can be higher positioned than the hip joint. But this is nevertheless the important point because it's the point of maximum curvature. Um, now you can also go down to the knee joint. I mean, you can be standing like this. In this case, okay, the hip joint is higher, the wrist is slightly higher too, but now the maximum curvature occurs here. And the angle between the fingertip and the point of maximum curvature is greater than 45 degrees. Um, going back now to the cord, we see sort of the same principles coming to action. Well, look at the thumb. It has formed a little mini arch here on the nail joint. The second finger is standing on the knee joint. This is the keystone point of maximum curvature. Uh, could we look at the, the fifth finger? You can, I mean, if you go round. You know. Uh, it seems here that the fifth finger is also now standing on the nail joint. So it seems to be peculiar to the thumb and the, the fifth finger that they can actually be standing on the nail joint. I mean, the, the, the second finger obviously likes to stand on. But this now ex explains, as far as I can see, why do I twist? Well. It's because the thumb, in order to form this little nice arch, it needs to be aligned with the arm. But the fifth finger doesn't need that. Um, so this summarizes, I guess, the main principle that I propose here. I mean, this is a proposition. You can do whatever you want with it. I mean, if there are points you want to comment on, you can comment on them and, and whatever. Um, but it does seem to me that it puts under a common theoretical umbrella the principle that the angle between the fingertip and the point of maximum curvature should be at least 45 degrees 
is a common feature of this position and, for example, this one. Um, did I have something more in my script here? I could just briefly mention the position where you're standing on the knee joint. Um, if I fold my hand like this, or I just raise raise the hand, the, the, na the fingers naturally fold like this. They look curled, but I'm not actively curling them. They have just folded. Is everything all right with the book? Yeah, yeah, don't worry. In this position, rotation seems to be particularly easy. Okay, this motion is most easy when, when you have sort of uh, natural fingers. But when you fold them like this, rotation becomes easier, it seems to me. Which means that playing like this, the rotary motion, I mean, for example, in the Taubman technique, becomes particularly easy. Uh, so it's just an observation that I think is interesting that, well, it, it, it results in playing with actually a very low wrist, could possibly. Um, but it's as long as you don't strike the key with the wrist, doing some kind of floppy action, I mean, which I guess is what is meant by collapse. Um, it's, it's a viable way of actually playing the piano with a low wrist. Just as you can play with a high wrist, with a wrist as the keystone. I mean, taking as an example, you end up in positions like this, don't you? Whereas, in other circumstances, can be quite convenient to play with the low wrist. So the point being that this idea of the state of perfection being the hanging arm and then we have the upper break and we have the lower break, to me that doesn't really stand up to scrutiny because we like actually to use all the range we have. I mean we like to twist, we like to play with high wrist sometimes, we like to play with low wrist sometimes. Um, but that the common principle among good configurations is a kind of standing finger approach. Um, that summarizes more or less what I want to say. So I say thank you and bye-bye. Um,